Hi everybody, it's Chris from SAS here, and welcome to Doing More with SAS Enterprise Guide uh, Tips and Advanced Techniques. I'm really excited to bring you this topic today. You know, I was on the original development team for SAS Enterprise Guide in SAS R&D, and I'm an avid user to this day of SAS Enterprise Guide. And I know all the nooks and crannies and, and productivity tips that I get through the day with, and I'm excited to be able to share them with you. So. Let's get started about what we're going to learn. These are the topics that we're going to cover during these sessions. Of course, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about Enterprise Guide, maybe some behind the scenes knowledge that you didn't have before, even if, you, if you've used it for a while. We'll talk about the basic topics like customizing your workspace and importing data, but we're going to go a little deeper than you, what you might get from an intro, intro course or, or tutorial. And I want to show you some tricks about the data viewer, how to get your content out to Excel. I'll show you about five or six different ways to do that. How to take advantage of projects and process flows. And I'm going to spend time talking about some special tasks that are built into Enterprise Guide to help you do some cool things that maybe you didn't know about. We'll talk about the query builder, of course. And if you're a SAS programmer, you're going to want to stay tuned for those programming productivity tips that I've got. And we'll talk about using source management like Git with SAS Enterprise Guide. And uh, finally, we'll get into automation using scripts. And uh, I'll make sure that at the end, you're connected with all the Enterprise Guide resources you'll need to be successful. Ready? Let's get started. Whether you're new to Enterprise Guide or a grizzled veteran, it's great to take just a moment and talk about the basics, about what is SAS Enterprise Guide. It's a client application, a client application that connects you to SAS and SAS resources. So it isn't SAS itself. It isn't the thing doing all the work to manage data and run analytics. It's a client app that connects to SAS where all that work gets done. Enterprise Guide gives you access to the data in your organization, whether that's SAS data sets or flat files or Excel or databases. Um, it is your interface into a lot of data preparation, and that can be in the form of code or it might be using the query builder or other fit for purpose tasks within Enterprise Guide. There are lots of tasks in wizards, hundreds, available in Enterprise Guide to make uh, everyday tasks simpler, but there's always the option to break out to code when you want to do something more advanced, or maybe that's just your preferred mode of working. Enterprise Guide lets you organize your work using projects and process flows um, to help you stay more organized um, and uh, repeat flows or, or sequences of things that you have to do again and again in an intuitive way. So Enterprise Guide is kind of your gateway to SaaS. Now, Enterprise Guide is not the only client application out there. There are um, other tools like SaaS Studio, which is a browser-based client to SaaS, and the SaaS add-in for Microsoft Office, which is um, kind of like Enterprise Guide in that it installs on your desktop, but it runs only in um, Microsoft Office applications like Excel or Word or PowerPoint. But in concept, these all these tools are operating in the same way in that they're a dedicated client app that many people may use, but they're connecting to a an installation of SaaS that's actually doing all the heavy lifting. That SaaS might be local on your local desktop, or it more likely is centralized. Um, maintained by your IT department or by somebody else um, in a in a central way. And it's uh, collecting the work that you want to be done in the form of requests that um, as you point and click in the client application and it's sending those requests over to SAS to fulfill and then sending you back those results. Those requests might be just open this data set and show me the values, or it might be run this query or perform this linear regression, and then it brings you back the results for you to view um, and do further action with. 
within Enterprise Guide. Now, many of us who have used SAS for a long time may have started using SAS installed on our desktops. So a lot of uh, SAS users still call that base SAS or SAS for Windows. Um, that is a, a way of working that is uh, becoming less and less common. And uh, here's why. Um, organizations are wanting to more centralize their computing resources and their data resources rather than having everything uh, scattered um, uh, amongst the organization on individuals' workstations, they would rather have um, their SaaS installation, which could be quite large, installed on a central machine or series of machines. And their data is uh, also not, um, it's not always a great idea to have that scattered around the organization. Organizations like to be able to centralize access to that as well. The SaaS grid technology is another way that customers use SaaS to scale up the way that their SaaS jobs run, maybe because they have lots and lots of SaaS users, or maybe they have jobs, um, SaaS, SaaS processing that happens, it's very intense, and they can spread the work of that, of that SaaS work across many, many nodes to scale up and, and get things um, computed more quickly. So SaaS grid technology works great with SaaS Enterprise Guide. Security is another big concern. So a lot of organizations like financial institutions or insurance companies or hospitals, they have access to sensitive data, data that it would be very bad if that data were to uh, escape the confines of the organization. So these companies, organizations, they centralize access to their data and require that their uh, analysts access them using these client applications. That way they can mitigate and limit the, the uh, potential that that data is distributed in ways that um, the company would not authorize. Um, going along with that, the this centralized scheme allows companies to have better control over who accesses, accesses the data and to have visibility into when that data is asked to access and by who. And so these auditing capabilities that are built into SAS, um, which um, is, are facilitated by using, by using just client applications like Enterprise Guide, um, are really, really important um, and help to minimize and manage the risk that organizations who have to do important work with sensitive data, the risk that they would face. And finally, let's not discount the, uh, the uh, simplification of software updates. SaaS is a big application and to uh, install it and update it can be quite a chore and it needs to be tightly controlled. Mission critical applications that rely on SaaS um, often have to go through a lot of validation um, every time that, that the SaaS installation is updated by keeping that in a central place that minimizes the the work that needs to be done we're not having to update SAS on all of our analyst machines instead we can update it in just one place where all of our analysts can access it likewise uh, SAS enterprise guide as a windows client application is easy to update so um, recent releases of enterprise guide have automatic updates actually that they can go out and check the SAS website um, for the availability of updates and then prompt the user to update that just with a click of the button. Now is a good time to check, if you don't already know, what version of Enterprise Guide you're running. Uh, the recent release, the most recent release at the time of this recording is version 8.2. And version 8.2 and 8.1 look and feel very similar to each other. The family of releases just before 8.1 was the 7.1 family of release, leading all the way up to uh, 7.15. There were several 7.1 uh, releases in, in that time frame. Um, or do you not know what release you're running and haven't really paid attention? It's a good idea to check. Um, 
Most of what I'll be demonstrating and talking about in this tutorial relates to Enterprise Guide 8.2, but almost everything that I'm talking about um, applies to 8.1 as well, and, um, and much of it also applies to the version 7.1 family of releases. These are the more modern uh, releases of Enterprise Guide, and hopefully you're running at least one of those. 8.2 would be ideal, of course. Um, but Enterprise Guide goes way back in, her, in history. The first release hit the field in 1999. And uh, it has been around since then with many major releases, some of them coinciding, coinciding with major releases of SAS. Now, one of the great things about Enterprise Guide is that it is backwards compatible with older SAS releases. So um, even though you might be using 8.2, you could still talk to an older version of SAS 9.4 or SAS 9.3 or even SAS 9.2, but let's, I kind of hope that you're not running SAS 9.2. That's a, that release has been out and outdated for a long time, but um, it gives you the flexibility to keep your, your uh, enterprise guide version up to date. And it doesn't require you to update your version of SAS, which is often a more onerous process for organizations to undertake and something that's much more controlled. If you're like me, you're going to spend a ton of time in this tool. While the default layout and appearance of SAS Enterprise Guide is designed to help any user be productive, it is worth taking the time to explore the ways that you can customize the environment. There are a ton of options available so you can change the layout, change the color scheme. So much about the tool that you can customize to help you feel productive. Let's take a look at some of the options you have available to you. Now, the main layout of SAS Enterprise Guide looks something like this. Along the top, you have access to the main menus and, and the toolbar for quick actions. Don't let the small menu uh, fool you. There are a ton of features that are available when you start digging into this. Over on the left, by default, we have the navigation area. This is going to show you things like your current project, if you're using a project, and uh, current files that you have available and open. Down below, in this servers area, part of the navigation area, that gives you access to what's going on with your SAS servers, your libraries, your data sets, and variables. You also have access to the tasks menu and if you're using SAS metadata, items that are available there, like store processes um, and, and registered metadata data. In this main area here, we have the, the work area. So this is where all of your content is going to appear. So whatever you're working on at the moment, that could be code, that could be data, it could be results that are have come back from SAS. This is where you're gonna spend most of your focus time in the tool and you can arrange this pretty much however you want. By default, the start page in Enterprise Guide is designed to be a nice launching off point for you to get going. But you can even customize that as well. Let's take a look. So first things first, dark mode. It's all the rage. All of the cool applications have dark mode. SAS Enterprise Guide is no different. In version 8.1, the, the developers added a dark mode to SAS Enterprise Guide. Here you see an animation just toggling back and forth between the two, dark mode and regular light mode. Um, but uh, in a demo just after this, I will show you how to enable this for yourself. But quick hint, there is just a nice quick keyboard shortcut that allows you to toggle between the two, dark mode and uh, regular light mode. That, that control F2 toggle will toggle between the two, but it won't affect any custom editor settings you have. So a lot of times, those of us who work in code or look at SAS logs, maybe we've customized the editor a bit for say, custom fonts. That's one thing I always change. So dark mode, the dark default dark mode setting won't affect that. So there's an extra step you'll need to do to customize. And again, I'll show you that in a demo just coming up. 
Another thing to note is that not all of the windows within Enterprise Guide respect the, the dark mode or what we call the Ignite theme. So a lot of the task windows and the query window, some of those pop-up windows, they still use the normal Windows default color scheme. So that's not going to be, uh, the dark mode is not gonna carry through to every single window within Enterprise Guide, but it does cover many of them. And also you might uh, find yourself wishing that you can customize the, the color schemes a little bit. And at this moment, you can't. So you can only toggle between the Ignite dark mode or the Illuminate, uh, illuminate the light mode um, and the default color schemes that each of those themes give you. You can't customize those themes if you want to uh, vary them at all. Another aspect of Enterprise Guide that is going to be pretty exciting and, and worthwhile exploring is the wide variety of workspace arrangements you have. Here, this animation is just flipping through a number of the different configurations that you could possibly have, uh, how you can arrange your windows so that you can see the work that you're doing um, and, and be more effective. In earlier releases of Enterprise Guide, prior to version 8.1, many users found themselves a little bit constricted because they could only see a couple of views of things at a time, say one data set and one code view. And if you wanted to see something else, you had to close one of those, one of those other views in order to open up something new. But in 8.1 and 8.2 and later, you can have as many windows open as you want. And you can arrange those windows in all kinds of different ways. You can, uh, you can have them uh, arranged in, in, in uh, geometric panes. You can tear off tabs of content and float them um, in your window and even over to multiple displays. So you can really spread out as you work in Enterprise Guide these days. Because there are so many options for the window layout, within Enterprise Guide 8.1 and later, I'm gonna just share some tips for how you can avoid getting yourself in trouble or get yourself back to a good spot in case you get uh, a little bit lost with so many windows going on. My first tip is to use the presets that are within the view menu. There are uh, some really popular default layouts that are available to you in, in those presets. And you can always choose one of those if you find yourself um, sort of at sea with, uh, with a layout that you've, you've constructed for yourself. You can revert back to one of those more comfortable preset layouts. You can float windows across multiple screens. And at the bottom here of my, of my presentation, you can see an example of where I've done that. I have two displays usually in my workplace, and I often float windows between the two to give myself more room to, to spread my work out. And you can also use F11 as a shortcut key to toggle back and forth between a full screen view of whatever your active window is. This gives you the opportunity to focus on a single, single piece of content, say a piece of code that you're working on without being distracted by other panes within the Enterprise Guide tool. As I mentioned that, that uh, start page at the beginning, uh, that start page amongst many of its features also shows you the recent content you, you've had open. But one of the really cool things that that start page offers is also a list of pinned items. You can easily pin an item that you've, that you've selected um, or used recently within Enterprise Guide, and that pinned item will appear uh, on a list, on a, basically a sticky list at the top of that start page. I use this quite often when I'm working on a project, sometimes over a matter of weeks. It's one of the more active things I'm working on and I just pin it for the time being so that I have quick access to it whenever I come back into the tool. Also, Enterprise Guide has a favorites menu that you can customize. So you can add your favorite tasks to, to uh, a quick list of tasks. You can add uh, t task templates to the, these favorites as well and I'll show you how to do that later on in this tutorial. Providing the, the, that list of favorites and recent, recently accessed items 
provides a, a quick access to the things that you use most often with an enterprise guide because there are so many features that this uh, this favorites list and this recent list gives you quick access to, to things without having to hunt around too much. In this demo, I'm going to show you some of those workspace customization tips that I promised. Okay, first, let's go ahead and do the dark mode thing. So that's Control F2 is the quick keyboard shortcut. If I just press the Control F2 combination, you can see it toggles back and forth. I prefer dark mode, and I'm gonna show you a couple of things here in dark mode, but for most of the tutorial, I'm going to keep it in the normal light mode because it, it just shows better on video. But while I'm in dark mode, um, there's a couple of other things I want to customize as well. I do spend a lot of time looking at code and uh, what's very important to me are the fonts, the, the programmer fonts. The default fonts within Enterprise Guide are uh, not, not the best uh, in my mind. I like uh, the default, I think here is Courier New, but I prefer some other special programmer fonts. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and find those settings under Program, Editor Options. And then under Editor Options, check the Appearance tab. And under the Appearance tab, you'll see you're, you have the ability to customize just about every aspect of, of uh, code and, um, and elements within your program to give them different color treatments. Um, I'm going to change my font, my preferred font from Courier New to one I like called Cascadia Code. This is one that I actually downloaded from Microsoft. It's free. Um, another alternative you might like is Consolas. That's another one that's built into Windows. Consolas is a good one, um, but I'm going to pick Cascadia Code. You can see this reflected here in this preview window, and when I click uh, okay, you can see it's re now reflected in my in my code window. Um, I'm not done yet. I'm going to go back into these editor options because I want to affect not just code, but uh, I want to look at what the logs look like. So I would like to also affect uh, the the log output. So I'm going to pick Cascadia code for that, and then. Also listing, sometimes I use a text listing output. I'm going to pick Cascadia code for that. And there, all applied, now I'm done with that. But sometimes I go back and forth between different settings and going back into here, into these editor options again, just to show you a trick you can do to get back to frequently used settings going to pick that appearance tab again and you'll see there's a an item here called scheme this allows you to group a set of preferences within your appearance settings together under a name um, and then you can easily load up the those collections of uh, preferences again um, to get back to them so I've already done that with my dark theme code theme but if, if I hadn't, if I, this is everything I wanted to do, I could use the Save As button here and give this scheme a name, such as Dark Theme Code, and save it. And then I have that for easy access later on. I've already done it, so I'm just going to go ahead and pick Dark Theme Code here. And then uh, under, I need to do the same thing for Log. I already have a Dark Theme Log. And then I'll do the same thing for listing. I have a dark theme listing. And then click OK. And then, I've, no, I have my, my named schemes applied. So that is, that got, got everything just the way I want it for dark theme. But I said I'm not going to stay in dark theme um, because I understand in these, as, as you're watching these videos, it can be a little difficult to see through the videos. Um, how things are going. So I'm going to change it back for a better contrast for the video back to the light scheme. So let's just click on, uh, I'll do uh, control 
uh, Control F2 again to go back. You can see it didn't apply it to my editor. For that, I need to go back to these editor options. And under appearance, instead of dark theme code, I'm gonna pick a scheme I saved it previously called light theme code. And you see it has the same Cascadia code applied. So I'll just repeat that step for the log file and again for the listing file. And there we go. Apply it. And there. Now I have it just the way I want. While I'm in here, uh, let's go over to, um, let me open up a project I have saved. Just gonna open that up here. It, I, I had it pinned on my start page. You might've noticed um, that gave it me quick access to it. I'm just gonna bring up one of the process flows th that it's already saved in my project and run it. Um, while it's running, you can see that um, the, the different statuses are, are highlighted for the different items. Um, as they complete their, they turn from yellow to green. But what's not happening is output isn't op opening automatically. If you've used previous versions of Enterprise Guide, you might have experienced where as tasks or code finishes running, results start popping up, uh, coming coming out of those uh, those tasks. And that can be disruptive in your workflow. So by default in version 8.1 and 8.2, um, those results are not popped up automatically. Uh, I've actually, I'm quite used to that now. I, I like that the, um, that, that as items complete, they, the results don't pop up. Then I can go and just open up the results that I want. For example, this program ran, I'm going to go ahead and open up the date, the data. So I can see, okay, now I have my, my data view for this item. Um, now that I have a few things open, let's start playing with the, the layout, the workspace. So um, I, like, uh, I like this, this nice big view of my data. Um, if you remember, um, a few minutes ago, I talked about how you can use F11 to toggle the full screen mode. So I can see nothing but my data. So I'll just press F11. And you can see, okay, now the whole screen is taken up by just my data view. And I can spend time in here, focused as I would like to, on just the data. And to get back out of that, I just press F11 again. And that takes me back to my normal project layout view. I can also do things like grab this tab and drag it around. And you can see the interface highlights to indicate where I might be able to dock this tab if I'm interested in docking it. First of all, I don't need to dock it. I can just float it. So you can see here, I have floated this window. I can resize it as I like and, and float it just in here. And I could even drag it over to another monitor if I wanted to. It's now off your view, but I have another monitor over here on the side that I can I can still see the data in. I could also dock it, um, and you can see in the center here the, the little uh, indicators that show where I might be able to dock this. Do I want to dock it to the top of my view here, to the bottom, to the right, to the left? So, or right back here in the center again as, as its own tab. So these, this provides a really easy way for me to move my windows around and understand exactly what's going to happen when I um, when I release my mouse button and allow the item to dock. So I can look here and I can see, okay, this is a great example. I'm now looking at, I have my data here, I have my code. Um, that's not the code that ran this data. Let's open up the code that ran this data, that generated that data. Okay, I have my code, and I've, I can see my code. I can see also over here my log, and I can see the data. Not a lot of space um, to, to focus on here. I can't really see all of my code, and I can't really see all of my log, and I can see just part of my data. So again, I can drag this code window around 
And notice that it all comes together as it's all kind of packaged up in one docking window. My, my code and my log um, all, all together. But I don't need to keep it that way. I can, I can take that log and I can move it around and dock it outside too. So I don't, even though by default, these items that are closely associated, like, like the code with the log and its output data and other results are all bundled together in one sort of uh, super window, I can, I can break that up too as I need to in order to sp spread out and have more room to work. I'm just going to leave this dock there for right now. And then I'm just going to dock this back to where it was. In there. Now my content windows aren't the only thing I can move around. I can also move around these, um, these resource panes over on the side. So I can pick one of these up and float it as well and dock it to another spot. And you can see all the options I have in this little preview indicator showing where those things would be docked. So for example, if I want to keep my project resources over to the side, I can easily just dock that over here on the right. And likewise, maybe I want to move my servers list, list over there too. I can do similar and just move it to be just docked underneath that one. So instead of the default view of having those resources over on the left, I've now moved them over onto the right. That makes That's a preference that some people have. Within here, I can also decide which things to show or not show. So for example, I don't need to have, um, I, I, I don't need to have all these things available in my, so if I don't use prompts, for example, I can just hide that pane and then it goes away and doesn't take up a, a spot in my list. I can always get it back by finding it in the, in the view menu. You can see all the resources here that are available and you can turn them on or off as needed as, uh, as, as your preference dictates. I can also move things around like if I want to move this servers item up here, I can put that over here in this, up in this list of tabs instead. So I can have my project and my servers right here so that I'm not looking at them each at the same time, but they are together and maybe I want to go ahead and just close these panes and then I have more space in here to see more items in my in my list as it as it expands. So lots of different options you have in order to make room for yourself in the kind of work that you do. And if you get yourself so um, out of whack that uh, you, you can't remember how you got here and how where you can find do windows you've closed or or rearranged in such a way that you can't get to them again, you can always go to the view menu and say reset to tap to default layout. And after a verification prompt, you can restore it and then you're back to back to the way you were. One of the first things we need to do when we start using Enterprise Guide is often import data into our project. Importing data is easy in Enterprise Guide. It's really just a point and click operation. But if you want to take it to the next step, there are some important things you should know about how the import data task works and some techniques you can learn to help bring that to the next level so that you can be more productive and reuse those import steps in other scenarios. Let's take a look at what's going on in import. So the import data task uh, is basically a point and click wizard. Uh, it, it gives you uh, really easy access to import flat files like CSV, tab delimited files, or Excel files, and a few other types as well. Uh, we're going to talk about how this works though behind the scenes and how to use some of the advanced options that are in the task to do even more and build repeatable steps. So how does it work? Well, 
the import data task works on local files. So that means you pick a file that you can access from your local PC. That may be on your local hard drive, or it could be on a network drive that you can access from your PC. But regardless, it is a file you usually select from your local system, whether it's a CSV file or an Excel file or something similar. Um, the first thing that the import data task does is it scans that file um, and it to determine the field names and types. So it, from Enterprise Guide, it looks through at least the first so many records of the file. And by default, I think that's about 4,000 records it's going to look through at the most just to determine, make its best guess at the field names and, and the types whether that's you know numeric or character, or does it look like a date um, or a currency value, that kind of thing. And, and then it will, that will set you up for what the, the rest of the steps that the wizard does. It will also try to uh, clean that file or cleanse it um, to, in case that you are bringing in a file, especially a text file, which maybe doesn't have the most standard formatting. And then it will present you with options for, for input. So it will uh, give you the list of those field names. Um, you can, it will give you the, all of those guesses that it made in terms of the, na the field names and the types and the lengths, um, the in formats and formats that should be applied. And then you have the opportunity to, to modify and customize any of those before you actually commit to do the import. Once you've made all of your selections and you press, press finish and the, and the import task runs, it actually takes this cleansed file that it prepared for you based on all of the selections you made and it copies that file from your local file system over to SAS. So it has done this work for you. It has, it has scanned the file. It has made a cleansed copy of the file. So it's basically duplicated the data locally behind the scenes, and then it moves that file over to SAS, where it's going to run some SAS code to actually do the import. So the SAS code that is running is actually formulated to run on this cleansed version of the file, not necessarily the exact file that you selected for input. It's on, it's on the file that Enterprise Guide prepped for the input work to happen in the SAS session. But is that what you want? Many of us do work with dirty data or file that is in the non-standard format. And so we can appreciate this cleansing work that Enterprise Guide is doing and the, the scanning it does and the guessing it does. But what if your data is already clean and already in the shape that we need? Do we need Enterprise Guide to do all that work for us? Well, good news, you can use some of the advanced options to bypass this step and not create a this cleansed file that gets moved over to SAS, and that will save some time. And you can also limit the, the, the scan, so limit the number of records that Enterprise Guide will read in order to do its guessing, and that can sometimes save you some time. You can then generalize this import step. It's a, that's another option you have so that it can be run outside of Enterprise Guide. So if all you're doing is point and clicking through in a project, you just need your file in SAS, maybe you don't need to do any of these advanced um, modifications on your options. But if you want to reuse this step in other contexts, then it's a great idea to, to go ahead and select these, these performance options, bypass the cleanse, generalize that import step. It will create for you a data step, or if it's an Excel file, it might even create a proc import step for you that you can run in other contexts outside of SAS Enterprise Guide. In this demo, I'm gonna show you how to import a file in SAS Enterprise Guide, and then to take that import process and modify it to make it more flexible later on. So I'm gonna start by opening an existing file um, and it's going to be, I'm just going to pick one from my local computer. And I have a series here of CSV files that actually contain my uh, online movie streaming history. Um, I'm going to pick uh, the top one here, the biggest one. And you'll see that just opens up in Enterprise Guide. And I can 
get a preview, just a text view of what that file looks like. Looks like a pretty straightforward CSV file with a, uh, a title and a date. That is the title of a, of a show and the date that it was streamed. Now, um, in order to import this using the import task, I'm gonna have to create a project in Enterprise Guide. So if I start the import task, it will create a project for me, or I can just click the Create Project button over here, and I can go ahead and uh, just for good measure, go back to this text file view, right click on the header and say add to project. So now that file is in, uh, included in my project. And then from there, I can right click on the file name and select import data. And this will bring up the import data task, uh, which will do the first level of scanning the file for me and um, and and get me started with, with the whole process. So for simple files, I could just click finish right here. Um, just trusting that the import data task is going to do everything it needs to do for me. Um, clicking finish and it will create a data set with the fields that, uh, that it detects. So let's see what that does. Ah, you can see it, it, it did the right thing. It created a uh, a title that was seems to be long enough to accommodate these fields and a date. An important thing to notice is it's a real date field, even though the file input is clearly like text. Um, the import with task uh, detected that, okay, this looks like a date format, so let's import it as a proper date. That way we can do sorting and, and comparisons and math on, the, uh, on that field later on. Um, but I'm not done. I'm going to go in and back and modify this task to optimize it a little bit. Um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check out the performance tab, or the performance button here. And you'll see that um, I have the opportunity to bypass the cleansing, the data cleansing process, which will um, prevent Enterprise Guide from creating a cleansed data file for me. Before I go into that, let's take a look at the actual code that was generated by the task. It's pretty simple code. Um, just it's a data step that's reading in this, this data file. But look at the path. The path is this big, long, um, convoluted path with a system generated name that actually isn't the file that we picked. It's a copy of the file, which is um, which looks probably a little bit different. In fact, let's go ahead and just open that up in another editor and just see what that looks like because uh, I'm, now I'm curious. So I'm just going to open it up here in, tech, in uh, Notepad++. And you can see the um, it looks similar to the file that we opened before, but it doesn't have the headings because um, the headings are encoded in the, in the program that was generated. And the separator character is not a comma, but it's actually a, uh, I think it's a delete character that is generated in this cleansed file, something that is unlikely to be encountered in, in the file itself. Um, so Enterprise Guide picks that character this, as a delimiter so as to not interfere with, with the real content of your file. But all of that is really unnecessary for most clean prepped data files. Um, and, and so I'm going to bypass that process. Going back into modify task and I'm going to go under performance and select bypass the cleansing process and click OK and finish. And now if we go back into the code, we'll see, ah, that is, it, that is the actual path of the file that we selected. The delimiter is actually the hex value for comma, um, and uh, everything seems to be all right now. Um, furthermore, we can further modify the task. If this was an Excel file, on the final path, we could say generalize import step to run outside Enterprise Guide. And in this case, where everything's happening local, it may not be, make such a big difference. Uh, but if it was, um, if if it was uh, more complicated than this, 
um, it the 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 code that it generates might be slightly different, um, op more optimized for running outside in another environment. As it is, this code I could just take this code and I could drop it into um, into another SAS tool like SAS Studio and, or um, or even just base SAS on Windows. And as long as the file is where it says it is, uh, the the import task would work. Um, I can further modify this this code if I want to to optimize. Sometimes you know um, the import data task is very explicit in the code that it generates. Um, it's it's going it's like going ahead and assigning a format and an in format to all the fields. And while the, those things are important for the date field because it tells SAS how to read the data um, and how to interpret it, for the text file or text fields, it's not as important. I don't need an in format to show me um, how to read it as a text character of a certain length. Uh, SAS will do that automatically. Um, and um, I might, if I want to generalize this for more, um, for for more. Uh, use other other places. I might uh, change the the title to be a different length. Um, to modify this task code to suit my purposes, I can just begin to type in here, and I'll get a, this prompt that thing, that tells me the code is read only. Do I want to make a copy of it that can be modified? If I say yes. Now um, you might have noticed when I went to import that data that I actually had multiple CSV files in that folder. Um, I actually have uh, five, five CSV files and they're all exactly the same format. And so um, I'm going to uh, change this, this uh, code to actually import all of them at once. This is a nice trick that the, um, that the in file statement can do for us. Instead of in importing just one file, I can import a series of files by just using the standard file name wildcard notation. So um, instead of underscore datasaurus, I'm going to just do underscore star, and that will match all of these files that are listed here in this, in this directory. While I'm in here, maybe I want to go ahead and modify the title to um, be a little bit longer to accommodate some longer fields that might exist. Um, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and change the name to Netflix all. Um, and uh, let's change, let's get, go ahead and get rid of the format and in format, because as we said, I don't need those. But I'm going to change the format actually to be date nine, because I prefer that. Um, but the in format needs to be the same because it is MMDDYYYY. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, remove the input, the, 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 the format descriptor on this input statement, um, in format descriptor, because I, I don't want to limit the number of characters I'm reading on the in format. And so if I click uh, run here, you'll see now I get also still a clean nice clean file but it's uh it's a lot longer it's all the re all the records here and with further modifications to this to this code i can i can also encode the file name that's going to appear um you know where which file it came from um by using the uh the file name option on the in file statement I'm not going to go into that right now. I actually have another tutorial on the SAS Users YouTube channel that you can check out that goes into, into this in much more detail. So I encourage you, if you're interested in knowing how to read multiple text files using SAS, starting with the Process and Enterprise Guide, um, you can go into my uh, go check out my more extensive tutorial uh, elsewhere on this channel. Obviously, when we're working with SAS, we are working a ton with data. Let's spend some time looking at the kinds of cool things we can do within the data viewer within SAS Enterprise Guide. Let me open up some data. 
And just to make it a little bit easier to work with, I'm going to go ahead and make this uh, full screen so I can focus on it. So I'm just going to press F11. Now, um, let's look at some of the features and functions of the data viewer within the tool here. Um, obviously, we can do our standard navigation. So I can use the arrow keys to move around between records. I can use the end key to get the, to the end of the record. I can press the home key to get back to the, the, the beginning start of the record, the first, the first column. If I want to navigate all the way to the end of the data, I can press control end. And that gets me down to the last record in the last column. Or if I want to get back to the top, control home will do that as well. Bam. We can also go to a specific record. If we know exactly the record that we want to go to, we can press control G for go to. And if I know the record number, uh, let's say 3000, I can type that in and go to the navigate to the particular column I want. In this case, I'll just leave it at its title, but I could pick a different column, click OK. And then you can see that the, the selection navigates us right down to that, the 3,000th observation. So I, I can also find in here. So I, just as you norm, you think you should be able to, right? You can press Control F and you can find uh, a piece of text or a value within the whole data set. So if I want to find, say, um, Tiger King and uh, search the whole table, so I'll find, and you can see uh, there it is down here. Um, it's uh, was down in record uh, 5793. Pretty cool. Once we're in the view here, we can look at the different properties for the column. So if I just hover over each column name, you can see it shows me the main attributes, the, the name of the column. If it has a label, it would show there. Um, and the length of the column uh, in, in bytes, in SAS terms. I can also go navigate over to way over to the scroll thumb. And as I, as I move the thumb around, you can see it's showing me a preview of which record I'm navigating to and the total number of records available. So that's that total number of records available is accurate when we're working with a SAS data set or with any data source for which we have uh, a, a known record count in our metadata. If we're looking at a SAS data view or some databases, for example, we may not know the exact record count as we're navigating, so that number will be um, indeterminate. Um, but in this case, it's, this is a SAS data set, so we know exactly how many records because that's encoded in the data set. I can also look at the properties of a column just by right clicking and select properties. And I can see just the, the, the more detailed properties for each column, the name, the type, the, whether it's a, the, the main group sort of like uh, that, that enterprise guide assigns um, a group to a column type. So that could be a date type or a currency, for example or a date time. All of these are numerics in SAS. They are treated specially because they are because they are special types, um, because they have certain formats assigned. If the column isn't showing isn't wide enough for us to see the whole value, um, we can auto size the column by just by double clicking on the border of it. And then Enterprise Guide Viewer will expand to accommodate the, the length of the, the largest piece of text. Um, largest value within that column. So in many ways, this data viewer works like any other tabular viewer that you're probably used to. Um, so nothing really special there. Um, I want to spend some time talking about how you can filter this data, filter your view of the data, and that is by using the, the where tool. So up here on the left, you can see the there's a button for where. And if I click to expand it, it will show me a field where I can type in my uh, where expression. And you can see, actually, it shows me an example of for this data source of what a where clause might look like. So this is a standard where expression in SAS. So if you are used to 
um, using the where statement within your data step or within a proc statement, um, the syntax that's valid there is also valid here. It's the exact same thing. So for example, if I want to do where the title contains, and I'm gonna use the question mark as a shorthand for contains, um, office, and press um, enter. You can see now my, my view is filtered to just, um, just records, and there are plenty of them that contain the word office. But I can get even fancier. I can combine with, uh, with, with um, Boolean values, Boolean expressions, so I can, say, and I want the date, this would be the date streamed, greater than, um, let's say, 01 Jan 2020. And notice I'm expressing this date value using the date literal syntax that we're all familiar with in SAS, where I have a quote, a quoted value, and then the, the D to indicate it's a date value. So I press enter here, and you can see now I'm filtered down to just the, the occurrences of streaming that happened in 2020. If I wanna go and change that to say less than, less than uh, 2020, so before 2020, um, I'm going to press enter there, and you can see, okay, now I've just got the pre-2020 dates. So pretty simple. I can also do between. So I can say where date between, Jan 2020 and let's say let's say 2018 and twenty nineteen. So just to remove amb ambiguity here, I'm going to put some uh, a parentheses in there just to, to uh, help that and press enter. And now you can see um, I get only the ones that are, occur basically within 2018. And how many records? I can look over here at the thumb and see it's only 213. 213 episodes of The Office were streamed in the year 2018. So um, big year, big year for The Office. We can also use SAS functions within these expressions. So another way to express what I've done here with the between operator is instead of um, using between and has, having to specify two dates, let's change this to where the date is just in the year 2018. Uh, so I'm gonna say where date, where the year part of date, or let's say year, the year function, which will return just the year, equals 2018. And I get the same results. If I want to easily just change this to, let's say I look at 2017, you can see, oh, well, there's very many, very many fewer. And if I go to 2019, I can see, okay, uh, go, look, let's look over here in the thumb, 140 records there. And then let's see how what this year has been like in 2020 so far. 165. So it's shaping up to be a big year for the office here. Um, so I can, all of these expressions can be, it can be quite, um, quite flexible to explore in here without having to do the work of say starting, you know, writing code or, or starting the query builder, which would can create a whole nother data set, which all of that takes time and space, um, storage. So this can be a faster way to get a quick view of of uh, what's in your data. Let's see, you can also look at the, the all the metadata properties for all the columns by clicking the properties button up here, this little uh, icon in the toolbar to view the properties. And you can see this is in general, the properties for this data set. And we have a columns tab that shows us you know, all the column information in all in one place. And if I want to save this off to say create a data dictionary or something like that, I can copy to clipboard and paste that into an Excel sheet if I want to. And it, there it is ready for 
um, some kind, any kind of reporting I might want to do on, on this data. And while we're in here, let's look at um, what it takes to copy the data out. If I want to take some of this data and put it into a, another place, I can just select the data I want, right click, and I can, of course, copy the values, but this feature called copy with headers is actually pretty neat. When I copy with headers, it, what it puts on the clipboard is a tab delimited series of values for these records, including the headers. So if I create a new sheet and paste that in, you can see in Excel, I have uh, basically a, a little mini spreadsheet that contains part of the data. This is a pretty in, pretty neat way to be able to share data out quickly uh, without a, a big process. One of the realities we have to deal with when we're using SAS in a large organization is that eventually the people we work with are going to want their output in Excel. Now, to some of us, that feels like a tragedy because obviously we much prefer working in SAS. But in order to keep our colleagues and managers happy, we need to find a way to get the great output we've created with SAS into a format that our constituents can be familiar with. Now, there are, there's no shortage of ways that you can export your SAS content to Microsoft Excel. And we're gonna go through a few of those here. Each method is different and serves different purposes. And it's important to have all of these in your toolkit so you can decide the best method to use for whatever situation you're in. But first, what do you use today? When you're working with Enterprise Guide, do you just use the export menu in Enterprise Guide or the share menu just to dump your data right into an Excel sheet? That is one thing you can do, but there are many more options. Or do you do it the traditional way of proc export from a SAS program? Certainly that still works too. Or maybe you are, uh, you stand on principle and you just won't create Excel files and uh, you'll leave your colleagues to their own devices to figure out how to get the data. If so, well, good for you. But uh, for most of us, we don't have that option. These are just a few of the methods we'll talk about. Um, I really like to talk about send to Excel because I think it's an overlooked method um, that is really simple to use for ad hoc purposes when you just need to get quickly get some SAS output to Excel. I'll talk about ODS Excel. That is something that is built into SAS. It is, um, you can create your, your report output pretty much the way you like it uh, in SAS using the SAS programming language. There are some options built into SAS Enterprise Guide to make that even easier. And then we'll also cover the export method, the, the, the export or share methods that are built into the menus within Enterprise Guide that allow you to move your data directly into an Excel spreadsheet. And we've already talked a little bit about the, uh, the copy with headers um, approach. That is uh, another simple way when you just have a few records that you want to to jump into uh, uh, an Excel spreadsheet with, or maybe paste into an email message. Don't forget that. That's a, that's a really simple method you can use without a lot of process. All right, here we are back in SAS Enterprise Guide. Let's take a look at Send to Excel. You'll find it under the Share menu in Enterprise Guide 8.1 and later. In earlier versions, you'll find it under the Send to menu. So we have a number of options here, depending on what el what other tools you might have installed. Um, but I'm going to pick, go ahead and pick Send to Microsoft Excel. What this does is it actually launches an instance of Microsoft Excel, and then it actually sends the content from S Enter Enterprise Guide into that sheet. It's kind of like a glorified copy and paste, or a um, is if you basically just yeah it's exactly like a glorified copy and paste who am i kidding so it's bringing up excel and actually sending the sending the records to excel and uh it 
it ran quickly. Um, now I can, while I'm in Excel, I can modify this, the sheet further if I would like to say bold the headings or do other kinds of things in Excel. And then I can save this Excel file and share it with other people. And that's um, a pretty typical way that uh, on an ad hoc basis, you might share content to Excel. Uh, but there's a couple of downsides to it. One is, um, first of all, if the data is very large, then it's going to be very slow to to act, to actually send to Excel. It's going to take a long time. And so it may not be the most efficient thing to do. If it's something you want to repeat, if you want to have a process in your enterprise guide project that does this every time you run the project, this isn't the way to do it. This is purely driven by the menu. So you have to point and click to make this happen. But there are automated ways that you can that, that you can send your content to Excel. So let's let's talk about that next. Let's talk about ODS Excel. Now, in if you're familiar with programming in SAS, uh, you are undoubtedly familiar with ODS and the many different options in ODS that we have that called destinations to create output in different file formats. The default one in Enterprise Guide and in many tools that we use is HTML. So we can create report output using HTML. And you'll see here, I've got that, uh, an example of a report I created. You, it's using HTML um, and it's got a graph and it's got some tables. Um, all of this together might make a nice report in Excel, but it's HTML right now. So how do we turn this into an Excel report? In Enterprise Guide, it's, it can be very easy. Under Tools, Options, let's explore the many different kinds of results that we can have. So HTML, as I said, is the default, but we also have Excel, we have RTF, or basically for Word, uh, PDF, and PowerPoint. We have our traditional listing, which is just text only. Um, and then we have the proprietary SAS report, which is used among some other SAS tools. Most of us are, are good with HTML in our day-to-day, -day, but sometimes we need Excel for other people, um, or we need PDF for static reports, that kind of thing. So you can change any of these options and set them at the application level to set your preferences. And then with e within each of those options, you have options to to say how you want that HTML. Do you want, which which uh, appearance style would you want? How about Excel, which there's metadata you can add into Excel and have all kinds of controls. But remember when you set these options here in the options, in the options dialog, it affects everything you're doing in Enterprise Guide. It is an application wide setting. So it would be nice if we can just control this on a task by task basis. And guess what? We can. We can get to the, that in the properties for each task or program that we're working with. And in this case, um, I'm working here with a program that generated this graph and table output. So I'm going to go ahead and select view and set properties, this little icon in the toolbar. And you'll see I have a mini version under the results tab here of my options. And so to get Excel output, I'm just going to select uh, to customize results formats and then uncheck HTML and check the Excel option and click OK. And then I'll run this. And then as it completes, you'll see I no longer have this HTML report. Um, instead, I have a placeholder for Excel. Enterprise Guide won't open the Excel file inside the app, but it will give you an easy way to launch Excel to so that you can see these results. And so we can see what this generated was an Excel file that has one sheet per piece of output. Maybe that's what you want. This is the default output from ODS Excel, but there are lots of options we can select to customize that. Let's take a look at what that looks like. I'll just close that. Here, I've modified my code a little bit. 
recognizes that I'm going to be creating some Excel output, I use the ODS Excel statement and this ID uh, option, which signifies I want to basically modify the Enterprise Guide generated ODS Excel statement to, to add or modify some options. I'm going to change the sheet interval to none, which means that it's not going to break out this content among different sheets. I want it all on one sheet. By default, the sheet interval is proc or table. I think it's table. And um, and so every every piece of output gets a, a different a different sheet. And then I want to customize the, the, sh the name of the sheet to just call it shows. So having made that change, I'll just run this. Uh, and it comes back pretty quickly. So I'll just open up this Excel output again. And we can see what is different. And you can see instead of having multiple tabs, multiple sheets, I've just got the one called shows. And everything is included on the one on the one sheet now as a single report. Great. That's a great that's a great start. Let's take this to the next level. What if I want to not just have um, my report output, but I actually want to share out my data as well. So the let's say I want to create a an Excel report that contained the report I just showed you plus the raw data from my sheet or from my from from my input so that we have that for reference within the same Excel workbook. There's a little more coding we need to add to make this happen. So what I'm going to do is undo this modification I made. And I'm just going to hit control tab to comment that quickly. And then I'm going to uncomment these other items that I've that I've staged here. Control Shift Tab or Control Shift uh, Slash does that for me. And just by way of explanation, really quickly, um, I'm going to first of all define where I want this Excel file to be. So um, by default, the the when Enterprise Guide generates ODS statements for you, it, the the, uh, the file it generates is in a temporary file uh, in the SAS session. And the Enterprise Guide does, um, does you the favor of bringing that file back into your session so that you can easily view it. I'm going to be explicit about where I want this to be. I'm just going to put it in the work folder, I'm calling it report.xlsx. And I'm going to use the ODS Excel statement myself uh, with, an, with my own ID, specifying that file output and then um, keeping those options I set before, the sheet interval none and the sheet name shows. Um, then at the end, I'm going to uncomment these items. When I'm done creating that report, I'm going to close that ODS Excel destination. But then I want to append in the same workbook a that, that detail data that comes from my, my viewing data set. So for that, I'm going to use proc export here, um, specifying the, the data equals viewing. I'm going to use the same output destination, output file. And I, in this case, I'm just going to be able to append to it. So one thing to know about ODS Excel is when you use ODS Excel, it, it always is going to create a new Excel file, a new XLSX file. But proc export can, can add to an existing Excel file. So we wouldn't be able to do this in the reverse order. I can't use a proc export and then use ODS Excel to append onto a file that I created using proc export. But I can use ODS Excel and then use proc export to append onto the thing it created. So I'm going to specify DBMS equals XLSX. And this does require SAS access to PC file formats, which um, in practice, most people have, but if you don't, just keep that in mind that in order to use proc export to generate native Excel files, it does require that module from SAS. I'll replace the sheet if it already exists. Um, in this case, it won't, but that's just specifying that. And then the sheet name, I'll just call this all viewing. Then the next thing I need to do, this is important, is I want to make sure that in my 
properties that Enterprise Guide is generating um, code for me, I want to customize these results formats again, but I'm going to deselect everything. So I'm going to clear out all of these options, which basically means Enterprise Guide, I don't want you to create any default ODS output for me. Click OK, and then I will run this. Now we can see a, a much longer uh, file name here. It's coming from my temp, my temp area and my uh, SAS session. But let's open this up and see what we got. So what we have is we have that report that we ha saw before, same as it was. And now we have a second sheet here, all viewing, that is the raw data that fed into that report for reference. So I've packaged up here in a single Excel sheet the the nice um, nice output um, from my project. Um, so it's ready for my constituents. Finally, let's look at how uh, export works. So within Enterprise Guide, I can I can also share directly to Excel an Excel file. Again, under the share menu, I can use export instead of, so instead of using send to, which would automate Excel and bring up an Excel session for me, if I, I can use, if I'd rather just d write directly to an Excel spreadsheet file, I can use export. So when I click on export, I get a, first of all, I need to uh, generate a, a name or select a name. So Let's let's pick a I'll just call it yeah I'll call it viewing, but you can see my files of type. I have lots of different file types here that I can pick from, but I'll pick XLSX, and then I can just save that. Um, and that's it. Let's see that file was created. Let's see if I can find it on my drive. Here it is, viewing.xlsx. If I open this up. You can see here, it's a, just a native Excel file, nothing really special about it. When you export this way, it's exporting just the data. So there's no formatting, that is no appearance formatting, no, um, no ability to export a graph or anything like that. This is just the data rows. And in this case, it, it's Enterprise Guide writing directly to the Excel file. So this, this style of export does not require uh, SAS access to PC files because it's, it's Enterprise Guide doing the work, not SAS. There is no SAS code generated to make this this part, this export step happen. If I want to repeat this step every time I run the project, then the thing to do is to select export as a step. So very similar to what I just selected before. I would just do share, but instead of export, I would select export as a step in project. And now I have slightly different um, interface, a little bit wizard to step through, but I have pretty much the same options. So I'm going to select this viewing and then the I want to export as an XLSX file. I have an option to use labels for column names if I rather. And then Click next. I'm going to put it on my local machine. I'll put it in a temp folder. And I'm going to select the overwrite existing output. So every time I run this, it will, it will overwrite the version that's there. I have a summary here of what's going to happen. And I click finish. And then it runs and you see it exports. Bringing up and viewing my temp folder here, I can see that indeed the file is there. And it looks very similar to what I just sh showed you with the, with the plain old export task. But the difference is that uh, this is like a task now in my flow 
And you can see it actually has a, a little bit of a log showing me what happened, that the export job uh, completed. And you can see that here now in my flow, there's this export step that is that now exists. It shows me the flow of things. So this once once this data set is created and this whole flow runs, this export step will happen again and generate that file for me. Let's talk about Enterprise Guide projects. One of the things that makes Enterprise Guide different from some other SAS tools is that you can organize and store your work within these project files, which can make it easier for you to maintain your work over time. Let's talk about some of the other advantages projects have for you. But first, what you need to know about projects is that you don't need to use them, at least within Enterprise Guide 8.1 and later. It used to be that every action that you did within Enterprise Guide would, it would first thing that would happen was it would create a project file for you. And if all you wanted to do was write code or open some data, a project file may have felt like a little bit of overkill. Well, now if all you're doing is coding or viewing data, you no longer need to have a project file going. But you do need project files if you have any kind of interactions with tasks or queries. So uh, that is going to basically kick off the uh, creation of a, of a process flow within your project, and you'd need that project structure in order for those things to happen. Project files uh, change over time. And the way it works with SAS Enterprise Guide is project files are always forward compatible. That is, you can, you can have a project file from a previous release and open it in a future release. However, once you've saved that project file in the most current release, you are not going to be able to take it back and open it up in an earlier release. That's a frustration that sometimes people run into, but it is just the way it works. And the way to plan for that is just to make backup copies of your, of your files every time you do a version migration, just in case. Project files uh, are, a, are a great way to organize your work and they can be you know, self-contained and that all of your, your code and your data and notes can all be in this one project file, but they are opaque to other processes. That means there's nothing else that can really read Enterprise Guide projects other than Enterprise Guide, or in some cases now, SAS Studio can open up project files and bring some of that work forward. But uh, there aren't many other tools that, well, well no other tools, that can really read a, a project file. So. Uh, a project file is not really shareable with people who are not using Enterprise Guide. You think of projects like a recipe. They contain um, the list of ingredients of everything you've done in order to accomplish the work that the project represents and the instructions for how to combine them, but it doesn't always contain those ingredients. That is, you may have uh, a reference to code or a reference to data, but the code and the data don't, don't need to be within the project file itself. They can live in another place on in a file system. Let's talk about some of the special things that you can do with projects though. Um, you can of course, as I said, organize your work and, and add documentation. Never a bad idea using the notes feature. And these can be like a sticky note within your project and process flow. You can create relationships between items in your project and your process flow with links. So you may notice as you build up your project and your flow that items are linked together and that uh, this task creates this data and creates this output. And so those things are represented in links, but you can create your own links that help to not just document, but also enforce a sequence of events that happen in your project. There's a special process flow called AutoExec that you can add to your project. When you have a project that contains a flow called AutoExec, much like the traditional SAS, um, SAS program that would kick off at the start of your, of your traditional SAS session, the AutoExec flow is a flow that will kick off when you open your Enterprise Guide project. 
Um, so if you have a special task or a, say a piece of code or a live name assignment or something that needs to run before anything else in your project, you can include this in an auto exec flow and basically encode and force that, that sequence of events happening. Projects can be much more portable among team members if you use relative paths for things that you reference within your project. So thing, files you might reference within your project include SAS program files or uh, flat files or Excel files that you're importing. You can mark these as, you can mark a project as having uh, relative file references and so that the project as you move it around will, will retain the, those linkages um, if you move that file to another directory or you give it to a colleague at, who has maybe a different directory structure, everything will work relative to each other when you use this feature. It's possible to inc include conditional branches within your process flow. You can set up rules for different parts of your project to run depending on conditions uh, as, your, as your flow executes. And if you have a special sequence of tasks that need to happen in a special order, you can capture this in what's called an ordered list. An ordered list lets you pick tasks from across your project, no matter what flow they're in, and add them as a sequence of things to run. And then anytime you run that ordered list, just those tasks will run in the order that you specify. And you can share work across different projects by using copy and paste. So you can copy a task or a, a one piece of item, one item from a project to another project, or you can copy an entire sequence, a whole flow um, across, across different projects, and everything will be maintained as you, as you copy from one to the other. I want to share with you a short demonstration of a special task called the Project Reviewer. Now, it's not built into SAS Enterprise Guide. It's a custom task. And you can download it for free from my blog at, at, the, at blogs.sas.com slash sasdummy. Just search for Project Reviewer and you'll find the blog with a, a link to the download. A couple of special instructions are included for how you would install this into your SAS Enterprise Guide. Once it's installed, you'll find it in your, in your list of tasks. I already have it installed, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, find it in my task list. It's called Project Reviewer. So I'm just going to type in project and you could see the task list shows me here. It works, of course, only if you have a project open. So I already have a project open. And it will show you the list of process flows that you have, as well as what's in those flows. So in this second flow, I have uh, uh, seven items that execute and they are programs and queries and, and the other tasks. They were all modified by me, so it's just showing who last modified them, how long they took to run the last time they were executed, when they were created, when they were last modified, and whether they have any errors. All of this is information that you can get from these items in your project. You can right click on any item that runs and select properties and see all of this information available to you. The project reviewer task just sums it all up for you in one view and then gives you the total running time for the project. In this case, it's a pretty fast running project. It only takes four seconds to run. I can also create a report out of this and encode this report into my process flow so that uh, anytime that the, that the project runs, it will actually create a report about how it ran. So I created a report and it ran pretty quickly here. And you can see a summary uh, report of, of basically what I just saw in that window, but now it's here in my, in my project in report form. And this task is now included in my project. So anytime my whole project runs, this project reviewer task would also run for me. It's just a handy little tool to get a little bit more information out of your project um, and make things a little bit more visible uh, for, for others to see what's going on. One of the special subtleties of SAS Enterprise Guide 
is how files get moved around. Most of the time, we're just pointing and clicking, and we're selecting files from our local machine, generating files on a remote SAS session, and everything just works. It just connects and shows up in our, in our Enterprise Guide session as if by magic. But what's happening behind the scenes is Enterprise Guide is actually copying files or moving files back and forth between your local PC and remote SAS session. You can take control of how Enterprise Guide does this when needed. And this is important because sometimes you need to explicitly copy files from one place to another. And there are some special tasks within Enterprise Guide that allow you to do that. One of them is called, fittingly enough, the Copy Files task. And think of this as sort of like FTP within your Enterprise Guide session. You can pick any file from your local machine or, or series of files and copy them to a location on the remote SAS session. Likewise, you can copy files from a remote SAS session, a remote directory on your, on your, in your SAS environment, and copy them to your local PC. Think of doing this when you have a local Excel file that you want to run proc export on on the remote SAS session, or you've generated an Excel file in your remote SAS session and you want to download that to your local PC to attach it to an email or distribute it to some colleagues. In addition, there are a couple of other special tasks specifically for data sets, and it's the download data to PC and the upload data to the server. These tasks specialize in selecting data set files from your local PC and putting them into SAS libraries or selecting SAS library members and downloading them to your local PC as a SAS dataset file. Let's talk about the upload and download datasets tasks first. They deal with SAS 7B DAT files. So we're copying from SAS 7B DAT files, that is a SAS dataset file, from your local PC to a remote SAS library. The download version of the task copies data from any SAS library to a local SAS 7B DAT file. And it's important to note that this doesn't need to be a SAS library. It could be a database library that you're pointing at. It will still make a copy for you and download it to your local PC as a SAS 7B DAT file. If you have used SAS Connect and PROC Upload and Download in the past, this works like those, but it's not using SAS Connect. Instead, it's using the connection that Enterprise Guide has with the SAS server to move these files back and forth. The steps, therefore, are not represented in SAS code. That is, even though um, there could be a little bit of code that is generated to fix encodings, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, most of the work that's happening, that is the file transfer itself, is not in a SAS program that you could copy and use in some other environment. As I just mentioned, there are some post-processing steps that can happen during these tasks to fix encoding. So if you're moving from, uh, coming from a, uh, uh, if you have a local SAS 7B DAT file that happens to be Unix encoded, but you upload it to a, a Windows server or vice versa, well, these tasks will fix that encoding for you. They will rewrite the data set into the native encoding of the SAS session where you're sending it to. Uh, the copy files task is a, a much broader workhorse. It can move any file between your local PC and your remote SAS session. You can remove, you can move one file at a time, or you can move a whole batch of them using standard wild co code no wild wildcard notation, such as uh, the asterisk or a question mark. You can also use uh, generate dynamic names and, and folders um, for as instructions for which files to copy and to where using SAS macro variables. If you're moving text files back and forth, especially between a Windows and Unix environment, you have the option of fixing those line endings as because the, those environments use different conventions for the line endings. 
And it also supports the task template mechanism that's built into Enterprise Guide, which makes it easy to reuse among different projects. So if you have a set of copy, uh, a set of files or a, a, a type of copy operation that you have to repeat over and over again in just about every project that you do, make a task template for that. And then it's easy to just drop that into any project where you need it. In this demo, I'm going to show you some examples of the copy files task in action. Let's imagine that I have a remote SAS session. Let's call it SAS app. And I have some local CSV files that I need to import using SAS app. And then on that SAS app server, I need to read those files in, do some analysis, create a report, say an Excel formatted report, and then download that back to my local PC so that I can use it there or in share it with colleagues, for example. So in order to get this done, I'm going to need to upload those CSV files to SAS app, do all of the work in SAS to create the report, and then download the Excel file when finished. So on my screen here, in, on the left, I have a list of my data files that I'm going to import. There, it's these CSV files that I've been using in other demos. There's five of them. The first thing I need to do is I need to create a folder on my SAS app server to receive these files. Maybe you already have one set up, but in my case, I'm just, I just want to uh, make sure that um, regardless of the file structure, I just need a temporary space of, for where these files are going to go. So what I've done in my program here is I've, I've identified, uh, first of all, the local directory, directory where these are coming from as a macro variable. And then I've created, using a trick in the, uh, in the live name statement, I've identified a, a path for these to go into, just a subdirectory of my work folder. And then I've created, using the live name statement, that, that folder, that subfolder that I can address using this macro variable called Netflix data. This is important because in the copy tasks file, the copy tasks task, I, I'm going to be able to use these macro variables. Let's take a look at the copy, the copy, ta uh, the copy files task right now. So I'm going to find that in my task menu and I can just search in tasks uh, for copy and you'll see the copy files task comes up and I'll just double click to open that. Let's take a look at the fields that the copy files task lets us use. First of all, I can pick which SAS server to use. In this case, I'm using SAS, I want to use SAS app because that's the folder where I'm going to copy these files to. I'm going to upload from my local PC to the SAS session because I need to copy the CSV files up there. And then I would specify the files to copy and I could specify the full path with a, an a wildcard using say star.csv and then specify a destination folder on SAS app where I want them to go. I've already done that so let's go, go ahead and open up the uh, the copy files task I have in my process flow here. So just modifying this I'll just show you what I've already selected. Upload and then I've used that macro variable I defined. This is the macro variable that defines the local path where my files are coming from. That percent or the amper local data backslash star.csv because backslash because Windows likes the backslash for their file names. And then the destination folder is that folder I created, uh, which I've assigned to net, the Netflix data macro variable. It's very important that I click um, resolve macro variables in source and destination paths so that the task knows that to expect some macro variables here and it will resolve those for me before it tries to do any of the copying. Just in case I selected to over overwrite existing files of the same name and because these are text files I'm going to go ahead and fix the line endings because on their, their Windows file name files text files they'll have um, a different uh, convention for the line ending um, than Unix does. And my SAS app happens to be a Unix server. 
So when I run my program here, first to define my macro variables, so that ran, and then I'm going to go ahead and run my copy files task. And let's open it and we could see the, the, the log generate here as it's, as it's copying those files. It resolved those macro variables, told me what files it found that matched my wildcard, star.csv, and then for each file it uploaded, it had an entry in the log. Now this, SAS, this is not a SAS program log. This is a log from the task. Remember, there's no SAS code that's happening here. This is all just work that the task is doing using Enterprise Guide. Okay, let's go back to the process flow. My next step is I'm going to read the data in, and this is using the same import style that I used before. I'm just gonna do assign a file name to this path with the wildcard star.csv, and then use in file to read them all in in, uh, in in one fell swoop. So let's go ahead and run that on SAS app. Great. Now, back to my process flow. I'm going to run another piece of SAS code that generates the Excel report. And again, this SAS code may look familiar. I've used it in other parts of this tutorial. But in this case, I'm going to set the destination to the folder on my SAS app server where I where the same folder I put the data in and then call this report report.xlsx and then generate the report using ODS Excel and then I'm going to tack on the detail data from my from from my report data as an extra sheet using proc export in the same Excel file and then I'm going to use the copy files task to copy that down. So let's look at my, the settings for this copy files task. So similar to the upload, but in the other direction. So in this case, I'm going to download this file from my SAS session to my local PC. The source I'm copying from is, is that folder on my SAS app slash report.xlsx. That's the file I intend to create using that, that piece of code I just showed you. And then my local destination folder is that local data macro variable that I defined earlier. And uh, just like I did before, I need to make sure I select resolve SAS macro variables. And I'm going to overwrite files with the same name, even though currently there's no, there's no conflict. And I do not need to fix aligned endings in this case because it's an Excel file. It's binary. There should be no, um, the, the, the line, Line endings, line endings is not an issue. So let's go ahead and run. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and run this to the end. So I'm just gonna right click on my task here and say run from selected item, which will run this task and then the one following. And then as it completes, as that copy files task completes, you'll see the report.xlsx appears here in my local folder and I can just double click to open that in Excel and see what we got. And there's my report. Here's my Excel report from ODS Excel and then all that detailed data that was created using proc export following that. So in a production capacity, I could I can just rerun this whole flow and it will copy the local files up to the server, import them, create the report, and then download that final report back to my local PC to complete the round trip of processing. I want to show you one more thing related to the copy files task. And this is a trick you can actually use with just about any task. Let's say I've defined the settings in my task that I want to be able to reuse in other projects. I can create a task template to do that. The way I do that is I can right click on the task within my pro project and select create task template. And my next step is to define a name for it. So I'm just going to call this copy Netflix files 
to server. And I'll just create, create it. I can actually, if I have a lot of templates, I can organize these in folders and, and um, do all kinds of cool productivity things. But for now, I'm just gonna make one, just, just a generic copy Netflix files to server. And now, if I search my, my tasks, let's see, under SAS tasks, I can copy. And you'll see here under my task templates, I have a new entry called copy Netflix files to server. If I open this up, you'll see it comes pre-populated with all the settings that I had saved in the version I created in my project. I can use this task in a new project to carry those settings over so that I can use them again and again. This is a great way to be able to reuse your work. You can also even share your templates with, with teammates using the, the task template uh, management system that's built into Enterprise Guide. Cool way to reuse your work. No Enterprise Guide tutorial would be complete without talking about the Query Builder. Let's face it, some of us spend a lot of time in the Query Builder, so it makes sense to make sure that we know all the things that it can do for us and so that we can take advantage of its many, many features. So here are a few things you should know about the Query Builder in SAS Enterprise Guide. First of all, it creates Proc SQL code. In a nutshell, that's really all it does. But Proc SQL is big. SQL as a programming language is big. So there's a lot, there's a lot going on here. The Proc SQL that Enterprise Guide generates is mostly standard SQL, but it has some differences. It offers point and click access to a bunch of data prep tasks. And here's just a few of those. Uh, obviously the basic filter with the where clause, all, all kinds of joins, being able to recode variables, to sort data, to summarize uh, and group those summaries, calculate new columns, connect to your databases, select and sub-select, um, so a sub-query or nested queries, select distinct, that is to dedupe uh, data, you can filter on join conditions. You can filter on the summary. That's the having clause. Uh, it can prompt for values. You can use enterprise guide prompts to, to prompt uh, an end user for, for values during your query. And then you can add SAS systems like uh, a label and a format to your, to your output. So this is a great time to think about what data you're using, what databases are you using in your workplace? Because the query builder generating SQL is compatible with many databases that are out there. So do you use databases or are you just SAS data only? Or maybe you use a database that your enterprise like Oracle or Teradata, or maybe you use a, a cloud-based database like Amazon Redshift, or maybe you don't really know because uh, somebody else set all, all these lab names up for you and you just point, point enterprise guide at data and query away. Let's talk about a few of the things you can do. Of course, you can do the simple, simple filtering. So once you throw your table into the query builder, it's easy to just go over to the filter tab and add one or more filters. And you can combine these filters in multiple ways. You can and them, you can or them, you can group them to create more complex logic as well. You can summarize. So you can, you can use the aggregation expressions like sum or count um, to to summarize data that's in your in your uh, in your data source and then enterprise guide will automatically group those summaries by the remaining fields within within your data source that you've that you've selected to include you can compute new columns um, so for example you want to create a a dummy variable that is a one or a zero based on the value of um, one of your fields. Well, that's easy to do. You can you can just uh, 
you can just use the expression builder to compute a new column. And uh, it, there are some built-in expressions that you can use, or you can create a more complex expression using a full-on expression builder tool that lets you select from a whole bunch of different functions and, and operators to, to build more complex expressions. Of course, you can join data, so you can add multiple tables. The Query Builder supports up to, I think, 32 tables, um, which is would be a crazy large join if you were to do it. Um, most of us join maybe two to four tables at a time, In, um, but I know some of you out there are, are, are joining lots and lots of tables. When you join tables in Enterprise Guide, the Query Builder will automatically select a, a key field for to do the join, the key field will be, the join field will be based on fields that are the same name and type. So it's not the most sophisticated way to auto select a, a join condition. You might find yourself having to delete joins in the Query Builder and reform them using the fields that you need to use. Um, it's a great idea if you know your data to be explicit about how things are joined. And of course, you can have all the different types of joins, left joins, right joins, inner and, and full outer, uh, as well as a number of like natural joins as well. And just like we sh saw with the copy files task where I demonstrated using a, uh, a task template to save the work we've done so that we can reuse it later, you can use task templates in a query setting. So you can create a query and create a query template. So a lot of us use some complex queries that can take a long time to build. And it's a really nice feature to be able to reuse that query later in another project. That's what the query template allows you to do. You can create a template out of a query you've built, save it, and then in another project, you can bring it up again and um, reconnect it with either the same data sources or different data sources that have the same attributes and um, and get a, a great leg up on, on reusing the query that you've built in the past. In this tutorial, you've seen me do a fair amount of SAS programming. I use Enterprise Guide for almost all of my SAS programming. It's one of my favorite environments for getting work done with SAS code. Why? Because I think that Enterprise Guide offers just one of the best SAS programming experiences that, that there is out there. Yes, there are great coding environments for general purpose coding, but there aren't any other environments other than SAS Enterprise Guide and perhaps SAS Studio, which really understand the context of programming in the SAS environment. The SAS language knowledge is baked into the program editor within Enterprise Guide. That means the language elements are there, the, um, the, the keywords are colored appropriately. Um, there's just so much of programming that's easier when you have an environment like this. Also, Enterprise Guide's aware of the environment that you're working in. So it knows which libraries are available, which data sets, and even the variables within those data sets. It can give you a list of formats and in formats and SAS functions. So there's so much available to you within this environment to just make the job of, of coding so much easier. Next, I'll share a few tips for how to get the most out of your programming environment in Enterprise Guide. Number one, turn on line numbers. If they're not on already, make sure that you go to your program and editor settings and turn on line numbers. Uh, they should be on already if you're using 8.1 or later. But if you're using an earlier version of Enterprise Guide, they might not be on by default. Next, think about what you want to do about tabs. Uh, may not seem like a big deal, but uh, tabs can make or break a team. You really need to agree on whether you're using tabs for indentation or spaces for indentation. Um, you, there are options within Enterprise Guide that you can set to control this behavior. It's you can set the tab size. You can insert spaces for tabs as you, um, so you can still use the tab key, but it's actually just space characters that are added into your code. And you can even replace tabs when you open new files from, from other places. 
If there are snippets of code that you use a lot, great idea to define those snippets as abbreviations within the editor. Then you can sh type little shortcut um, pieces that will auto-complete to the full-on code that you, that you need to use all the time. I do this for live names every day. I have some, I have some SAS libraries that I access all of the time, and I have abbreviations set up that, um, that make it easy for me to just define those in any program. This is a cool thing that's new in Enterprise Guide 8.1 and, and later, is that you can actually um, not just see the variables within your data set, but you can drag those right into the, in, into the program editor by uh, selecting them from your, your uh, server tree, your library list, and drag them right in, and then um, add, them, add them right to your code. Pretty cool. We all like, we all have our favorite ways to format SAS code in terms of our indentation and what we break lines, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but Enterprise Guide can format code for you. It may not be able to conform to all of your preferences, but um, it's an easy way to, to take code that is otherwise messy and difficult to read, um, highlight it, or just select the whole file and um, right click and say format code or use the control shift B keyboard shortcut in 8.1 or later or control I in earlier versions of Enterprise Guide that will format the code automatically. Don't forget that you can zoom in and out of your program window. Really handy when your program is really long. You can zoom way out and get a, a great idea of, of your program flow and how the structure is. This is a little known trick, um, but it can come in handy sometimes. You can use the Alt key, Alt key and the, and the mouse key and shift to, to highlight uh, columns of code so or columns of text so that you can then um, select these blocks of text uh, as a column and copy and paste them into someplace else. Pretty neat thing to be able to do sometimes. Of course, every editor has find and replace, um, but don't forget that Enterprise Guide, like other powerful editors, also allow for regular expressions to match for, match on things that you're looking for and also replace things that you're looking for. So using the regular expressions and, and learning a little bit about how regular expressions can help with pattern matching to do more complex find and replace operations um, can really save you a lot of time when you're making big changes. Another hidden feature in Enterprise Guide is the ability to split your programming window. You can right click in, in the window and select split, and split the view, and it will um, break your program into multiple views of the same code. Um, and then you can scroll those views independently. So even though you're looking at just one program file, um, you're looking at different parts of it. It can be really handy when you've got, say, a data step uh, with some columns defined in one part of the program, and then you need to later on in the code reference that data, data set in its columns. You can uh, kind of pin the, the data step uh, definition to the top and then work in your code uh, down below in a different view. And if the program editor isn't good enough for you or there's a, some other uh, thing you need to do that the program editor doesn't support, you can always uh, right click and open the, the code out into a your favorite default editor. Um, I sometimes use Notepad++ or VS Code to do other things. So you can, from within Enterprise Guide, open up your code in one of those other editors, make changes there. Enterprise Guide will detect when you've made changes in another editor and you've saved them, and it will update your view within Enterprise Guide um, to reflect the latest changes you've made. And don't forget the data step debugger built into Enterprise Guide um, since uh, version 7.1.2, I think. Um, the data step debugger is a great way to find out what's going on inside your data step. It's only good for data steps, but 
Um, it's an interactive debugging environment that allows you to really figure out what's what's happening when when you get stuck. It's also a great teaching tool and learning tool to know how the data step works. Like any programming environment worth its salt, SAS Enterprise Guide also integrates with Git. Git is a version control system that is has basically taken the world by storm. You may know it from working with GitHub, but there are other commercial systems like Bitbucket and GitLab that also integrate with this protocol. Git is an open source version control system that is embedded into many, many tools, and Enterprise Guide is one of those. And it's just one of uh, several SaaS tools that have Git integration inside of it. It's a distributed version control system. Um, it's uh, it's unique in from other systems, other version control systems, in that every developer gets their own copy uh, clone of the code repository. Uh, it supports a variety of different workflows, um, and uh, as I mentioned, it is it is open source. Um, Git aficionados um, often work exclusively on the command line with Git, but Enterprise Guide offers a nice user interface, a standard user interface flow for how you would clone repositories, um, commit, you make changes, commit those changes, push back to the original repository, view history, all of that in a way that you might expect, especially if you've worked with other, other tools. Git has its own vocabulary as well. There's quite a lot to learn. Um, we've I've talked about it extensively in other forums. So um, while I could spend an hour talking about it here, we don't really have that much, that time. But if you want to go deeper on this, I encourage you to search on communities.sas.com for, for Git integration, and you'll find links to other webinars that we've done that describe the Git integration specifically with SAS. Just a real quick overview, Enterprise Guide supports Git in a couple of ways. Um, one is without actually um, using, using any Git infrastructure at all that you need to set up, it can support it just completely inside the project file. So if you develop SAS programs and embed them in your project file, you can take advantage of Git-like functionality by having a program history. You can commit your changes into this, into this local project specific repository. You can view history, you can um, revert back to other versions. So you can get a, quite a lot of the, the features, get like features from within that without any additional setup. But if you do have Git in your workplace, and that may take the form of enterprise GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket or something else, then you can take fuller advantage of, of the Git integration within Enterprise Guide and SAS tools that allow you to clone repositories of code to your local machine, work with them within Enterprise Guide, commit locally, push back uh, th those changes to the, to the original repository, um, do all the branching and fetching that you would, would expect be, be able to do in just a full-fledged Git system. So I encourage you, if you're working on a team especially, to learn more about this topic because using source management with SAS code really brings a level of discipline and rigor to your projects that, um, that is basically table stakes now for anybody who's developing code. By now you've realized that SAS Enterprise Guide is primarily an interactive tool that you use point and click. But uh, that doesn't mean you can't automate things. In fact, Enterprise Guide has a pretty rich automation model that you can use to actually script operations and do things when, uh, make Enterprise Guide do things unattended. In fact, this is exactly how Enterprise Guide works when you schedule a project. When you use a the interface to schedule a project or schedule a process flow, Enterprise Guide generates a script file for you and adds it to the Windows scheduler to automate this activity, maybe when you're not even uh, at your desk or logged in. 
So we can use that same mechanism to script Enterprise Guide, but writing our own scripts to do whatever we want with, within the tool. It's not just for scheduling. Now, the script is, um, can be, it's most often VB script is the, is the language that's used, but it doesn't have to be that. It can, you can use PowerShell, you could use Python, any tool that can automate COM compliant tools, uh, these are Windows applications, uh, can be used to automate Enterprise Guide. Here's a very simple script. This is the very basic kind of are you there script for automating Enterprise Guide. It declares a couple of variables, an application object and a version object, and then it, it, uh, it initiates the application object with the create object method on the wscript method, wscript object in vbscript. And uh, this just generates an instance of the Enterprise Guide 8.1 and um, and then echoes out to the console the name of the application and its version. And the result, unexciting but uh, effective. You get to see uh, that the Enterprise Guide actually started up and it can report back its version. And this is a great, very sort of first, first step script to use just to make sure that uh, everything is working in terms of your scripting mechanism. And then you can move on to do more complicated things. And we'll take a look at that in just a second. Let's take a look at some examples of automating SAS Enterprise Guide in scripts. All of my examples here are going to be using VBScript. It's pretty easy. It's built into the Windows operating system. But as I've said before, you could use PowerShell or Python if those are the languages you're familiar with. Let's take a look at the first one. Uh, this is basically, I'm just going to show you a demo of the one I showed you just a minute ago in, a sl in slides. Um, this is the uh, just creating a new application object. Um, it's a great script to run when you want to just make sure that all of your, your mechanisms are working. So I'm going to, I've got here my, my script in Visual Studio Code, VS Code, and then I've got a terminal open um, underneath. It's just a normal command terminal for Windows. And so I'm going to go ahead and add, um, we'll just call it the C script um, executable. And this is in my Windows directory under syswile64 because, um, confusingly enough, that's where the 32-bit version of C script is. And the, and the version of SAS Enterprise God that I'm automating is a 32-bit version. So this is important to remember, the version of C script or W script that you're using to automate has to match in bitness to the version of Enterprise Guide that you're using. So if you're using 64-bit Enterprise Guide, that's fine. Just make sure you use the 64-bit version of the scripting runtime that you're using to automate. So I'm just gonna automate this, uh, this new app VBS. So I'm gonna run that. And you see, come back, lickety split, Enterprise Guide version 8.2. That is the version that I am running. Great. So let's clear that. Let's move on to the next project, the next script. It's a little more complex. Um, I've, I'm going to use this script to actually create a new project in Enterprise Guide, add a program um, just by adding a new, a, in a new code object and then um, and then run that program. So we do that with a, by adding to the code collection in the project, setting the server. In this case, I'm just gonna use the local server. First, I'm setting the profile. The profile is the metadata profile that I'm connected to. And there's a special value here for the metadata profile called null provider which means don't connect to a profile. And I'm just using my local SAS for this work. The program I'm running is just a simple proc options. And then I'm going to save, after the pro program runs, I'm gonna save it to the, my local current directory in this file called testprogram.log. And then this little function here is just a helper to get the current directory for where my script is running. So let's run this one. And when that comes back, you see over on the left in my list of files here, a test program log was created. Let me just throw that up here and you can see the contents of it. It is 
looks like a SAS log. So perfect, it did its job. Let's move on to the next example. In this one, uh, I'm gonna just use the automation object to show the list of available profiles. So the, we mentioned the special null provider value, which says don't use a profile, but you might have one or more profiles that you use in your enterprise to connect to different SaaS environments. So let's see what I've got set up. Um, this automation uh, step will, will show me just a list of available profiles and some of their details. And that runs pretty quick. And you can see here, here's the metadata profiles I have. And um, each one has a set of details, which in the video I'm gonna blur out because it contains some secrets. So I don't want to reveal some of those addresses. Okay, clear this. Um, and then finally, let's move on to just running a project in batch. So in this, in this example, I'm going to take a, um, I'm going to once again, uh, launch enterprise guide automation, setting the active profile to one of my other SAS profiles that connects to a, a SAS app server. And then I'm going to add a new, a new uh, program to, uh, to my new project. And, um, and then I'm going to run this, this program here. Now I've just coded the program here in text right inside my script. In reality, you might have the program sitting on disk somewhere and you could use VB script to just read in the file and assign it to the program about the SAS program value here. Um, in this case, I am just creating a simple data step that creates a, a data step with a, a bit of a, a subset and then running proc means on that. And then I'm going to save out the log um, output. And then if it contains, if I, this project creates output data sets, which I think it will, um, then I'm going to use enterprise guide, uh, this enterprise guide output data sets object to save that data set as an Excel file. So I'm basically automating the export to Excel within my script. The, the, the program in SAS is creating a data set, but Enterprise Guide is going to save it as an Excel file. And then I'm going to also save a, the ODS output, which in this case is going to be a listing output. So let's run that. And as you see, these results come back. We have a log again. Just throw that up in here and see that looks pretty good. Uh, we have a listing file this time. So let's throw this in here. And it looks like it's the output of our proc means in listing format, so perfect. And we have an Excel file. So let's just double click and open that in Excel. And there is my data that was created up there on the server. So all of that automated um, can be, it can be run unattended. Perfect. And that's it for this tutorial, but there is much more that you can learn. Here are some resources you can use to learn more and, uh, and ask questions if needed. Of course, please visit communities.sas.com. Uh, that is a great place to ask questions of your fellow SAS users. And there is an active enterprise guide board there. Uh, lots and lots of users who um, are willing and eager to answer your questions. Also, I'm there too. So I am happy to jump in and answer questions. I have published a lot of articles already uh, about what I know about SAS Enterprise Guide on my blog at blogs.sas.com. You can just search for SAS Enterprise Guide there and you'll find lots of articles. Um, to continue your learning. We have webinars. Uh, they are, you can be found at, in the Ask the Experts section in the communities as well. Just look for Enterprise Guide in there. Um, this channel, of course, youtube.com slash SAS users. There's um, and lots of Enterprise Guide videos, some of, whom, some, some of which I've recorded. So please uh, check those out. You can find me on Twitter at CJ Dinger. Send me email. Contact me on LinkedIn. Um, 
or message me on communities, please. Um, I want to be able to help you. I want to hear from you, leave me comments, um, and con continue your learning on happy, happy enterprise guiding.